My name is Sarah Olney. I'm the Liberal Democrat MP for Richmond Park, and I speak for the Liberal Democrats on business, climate change and transport. Great. Um, what do you think uh, the manufacturing and for businesses can seize on in a, in a sort of post-COVID world as we look to look to the future? Well, um, obviously a post-COVID world is also going to be a post-Brexit world and that will uh, bring its own challenges, obviously. But what I'm really, really interested in is what we can do to really take that massive step forward we need to see in uh, greening our economy. Um, and I think there are two major areas that I think are really interesting for manufacturing. First is around um, power generation and new forms of power. Uh, obviously, we talked about a lot about renewables. Uh, we've talked about solar and wind. Um, but the, you know, the, the, the big new thing that everyone's getting excited about is hydrogen. So I'm really interested to know how the manufacturing sector is going to respond to some of those challenges and how they're going to be embedding some of those new uh, forms of power in their in their manufacturing. But the second thing I think which is going to be really interesting, and again, this is something we need to really get a, a grip on very soon. It's, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's one of the most urgent things. Um, and it's about greening our buildings um, and how we can make them more energy efficient because we can obviously look at all these new uh, forms of power, but actually the, 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 the best thing we can do, both in terms of carbon emission, but also as a boost to the economy, is just to use less power. And if we can make our buildings, both our residential, but also our uh, commercial spaces, our manufacturing spaces, our public spaces, if we can really get to grips with the challenge of um, I mean, we call it retrofitting, but, you know, making our existing buildings more energy efficient and, you know, designing energy efficiency into our new buildings, then I think that's got really great potential, both for our pathway on to, to as a country, as a world, towards net zero carbon emissions, which is so important and, the, the you know, the, the, the challenge we really have to face in the next decade. But also, I think it just has so many benefits for our economy, as I say, both in terms of using less power, uh, has an obvious uh, advantage, but, um, you know, there's, there's um, some fabulous new sustainable skilled jobs that we can create uh, um, if we really grasp the metal, as I say, of, of, uh, of zero carbon. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and what do you think if uh, what do you think the, the role of the government should be in in sort of supporting business um, embracing a new green economy? Um, I think they've got a really important role to play because what we need to see from government is um, some of that initial investment. Uh, investment into some of the more experimental technologies to de-risk it for uh, private investors who might want to come in and you know I think the bulk of the capital for a lot of this work is going to come from the private sector but as I say that the risks at the moment are, are fairly substantial and a bit of government investment in some of these things can really set the ball rolling. I think what we need to see is a bit of regulation, particularly in the building sector well, that, that I was just talking about there. If, there's, if they're setting the standards and saying that all future homes have to be zero carbon, then that's a challenge that business then has to come in and meet. Uh, we need to develop new technologies, for example, for heating. And I think there's some really great opportunities then for, for business to come in and, and start to develop those. But if, if we don't have that expectation that that's what's going to be delivered, then the housing sector, for example, are not going to necessarily invest. So, um, so I, I think that's what we need to see from government. And, you know, they need to be prepared, as I say, to, to bite the bullet on some of the regulatory aspects. It's going to shall we say, upset some of their friends in, in, the, in the housing sector. But, you know, they have to be prepared to do that if we're going to take the, the step change that we really need. Um, next year, hopefully, um, COVID, uh, COVID reliant, we, uh, the UK hosts um, COP26. Um, what do you think, what are your ambitions that come out of that, that global summit? Well, I'm feeling more optimistic about that already. Uh, and actually, I'm quite pleased that uh, thanks to COVID, we have had to delay it. And one of the reasons I'm feeling more optimistic is because we have a new American president who is much more uh, um, committed to these goals of, of tackling climate change than, than <laughs> the previous one was. And I really do think that that will make a big difference in what can be achieved. And obviously, we want to get some alignment across governments about uh, reducing carbon emissions. It's something that can that really has to be done um, as uh, an, an international commitment, because we can't have different countries undercutting each other. And what we're seeing, in, you know, is a big problem, for example, in um, exporting our carbon emissions. So, you know, we'll, we'll import something that's been very carbon intensive from, you know, somewhere else. And then we're kind of like, once it gets to this country and continues its manufactured process or, or whatever, suddenly it's like, oh, well, we're net zero, but, you know, we're, we're not paying attention to what's happening elsewhere. So I think... Um, 
and I think I think it will be really great to see some. And I, I think other countries then will feel more emboldened, if you like, to to sign up to more um, more ambitious uh, carbon reduction targets because they know that America are serious about it. And you know, always in this country, for example, the big thing is like, well, we can do X, but really we're only one percent of the world's carbon emissions. If America and China aren't doing it, then what's the point? And it's like, well, if America are on board and if America are coming with us, then you know, obviously it makes it worth our while. And if you know everybody's doing it, then you know the the anxieties about competitiveness start to fall away. Uh, and in actual fact, I think we'll, we'll reach that tipping point quite soon where you'll be uncompetitive if you're not in using renewable uh, energy. And if you're not being energy efficient, that will have a bigger impact on your competitiveness than the transition will. So I think, I think um, the knowledge that America might finally be coming back to you know, do this journey with us, I think will have a really, really positive impact on what can be achieved. Um, you mentioned Brexit earlier. Where do you see the UK government um, taking this agenda in the next few years? Well, I think it's really interesting because um, Boris has shown Boris Johnson has shown a real uh, interest in it. Um, and you know, the cynic in me—I'm an opposition politician. I'm allowed thinks that you know he he picks up the climate change agenda whenever he doesn't want to talk about something else whether that's the government's handling of coronavirus or the prospects for a, a deal with the EU but nevertheless I I am um, I, I still find that quite positive because I think um it, you know he wouldn't be talking about it there was something else that he didn't want to talk about if you see what I mean so I, I do I do sense a genuine um level of commitment from from the government there but they really just need to get on board with this the, the things I was talking about earlier renewable energy um and and our buildings those two uh metals if you like are the ones that really have to be grasped and also you know a transition in our our transport infrastructure um, that that's that's what we really need to get uh, get to grips with if um, if we're going to make going to make a, a serious dent if you like in our carbon emissions. So I think he's talking a good talk so far, but we need to see much more action. And I have to say, speaking as the climate change spokesperson for the Lib Dems, one of the big challenges I find is I can't pin down who in government is responsible for delivering net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Who is it who's doing it? They're doing a little bit in MHCLG, uh, housing communities and local government. They're doing a little bit in transport. They're doing a little bit in bays. Uh, they're doing a little bit in DEFRA. But, you know, it's it's not a coherent picture. And I cannot see that timeline and that set of, uh, of goals that they've set for themselves in order to be able to achieve it. And it needs to be that one person who is answering to government, to parliament for achieving net zero. And if we don't have that single point of responsibility, um, so, for example, the equivalent of the Chancellor, but for carbon emissions, do you see what I mean? And not responsible for spending the money, but for saving them. And, you know, I, I want to be able to see, you know, year on year, a real advancement towards that goal. But as long as it's it's parceled up across all these different departments, it's really difficult to track progress. So I think that could that could be a significant change if they could at least do that. And then we could see, you know, as I say, all of these different elements, um, you know, what real progress they were making. That's great. Um, and you just mentioned uh, net zero there. Do you think that's an ambitious enough target? Do you think we should go aim, aim higher? Where, where do you see that as a target and whether it's achievable at all? Yeah, so there's been quite a lot of discussion about whether we want net zero to be in 2050 or 2040 or, you know, other groups even being, you know, going um, quite radical and saying, yay, let's do it by 2030. Um, and I think in a way, um, the actual date is not as important as working out how we're going to get there, because our our policy on this is that we need to make the big changes early uh, and then we can get the bulk of that uh, net zero uh, emissions achieved. Yeah, why not by 2030? And then it's the long tail that you need to deal with. Now, the long tail are things like people who can't afford to change their cars, for example. The long tail are those industries that need a lot of investment in order to adapt to renewable energy. The long tail are, you know, those hard to reach homes or the ones that, you know, take are going to need a lot of investment before they can be retrofitted. So but we can make the big changes now in the next 10 years, then, you know, I, I don't see why we shouldn't look for instead of one big, um, one big goal of 2050, 
which, apart from anything else, lets the current government off the hook of doing anything at all about it. Um, we, we should be looking, you know, staging that into sub goals, if you like. We could achieve 75% net zero emission by 2040. Um, we could, you know, make 30% of a difference by 2025, maybe, depending on what we did. So I, I think rather than worrying too much about when the big zero is achieved, we should be setting out, you know, what, what, the, what the stages are and um, what the sub goals are. Uh, so that we can make sure that we're on track. And as I say, apart from anything else, it, you know, one big goal of you know 30 years time means that the current government don't have to do very much at all. As long as somebody else does something later, we can still achieve that one big goal. We need smaller goals along the way. Thanks, Sarah. My final question. Um, it's uh, the day after the general election. Uh, the Liberal Democrats have swept to power. You've been appointed... Uh, <laughs> You've been appointed um, Secretary of State for Bayes or climate change. What would be the thing you would do on day one, do you think, to sort of start to shape this agenda? So something I'm really interested in, um, and I think this could really make a shift in consumer behaviour, which would then obviously drive business behaviour, is if perhaps we started introducing a carbon footprint onto packaging so that you could see, and when you were making your choice in the supermarket or whatever shop you're in, or on Amazon, um, you could see how much carbon had been used to produce the product. And we'd be looking at the whole supply chain. Um, and um, and I, I hope that in the same way with, with having that kind of labeling on food packaging has really driven the industry to try and, and develop healthier versions of their products. Um, you know, it would, it would really cause manufacturers to look at their products and think, well, how can we start to reduce the carbon in our supply chain? In our production process um, and I think consumers would really respond to that and they would know then that they are making you know carbon healthy choices perhaps we could put it like that um, and I think that you know and if we were to drive that change in consumer behavior I think that might change uh, make some real changes in, in industry and producer behavior and, and not just here but also abroad as well I think if um, where our supply chains are, are situated abroad and I think that could make a real difference. Sarah, thank you very much for your time today. I'm sure uh, everyone who's uh, going to be watching online and, and when we um, pass this out will be really grateful for your, for your answers and your time. Pleasure. Thanks very much for having me.